He's going to talk to us today about Wagner's legacy in the leitmotivic film score. Thank you, yes. I'm going to apologize at the outset because I have a large number of film and music examples that we won't have time to hear, but perhaps if some of you would like to stay during the coffee break, we can watch some of those then. Um, some years ago, I was speaking with a neuroscientist friend of mine about an article she had read uh, that purported to prove that people who read the newspaper on a daily basis were better informed about current events than people who did not. And we had a chuckle over this, and, and she said, you know, I think there should be an interdisciplinary publication that scholars who are, are uh, writing such things could submit to, and we would title it the Journal of Duh. Um, <laughs> My title maybe seems like a candidate for that journal, but I'd like to say uh, that actually Wagner's legacy in the leitmotivic film score is a little bit more complicated than it might seem. There seems to be an almost blithe acceptance in writing about film music that themes associated with the drama come to us from Wagner, and this is usually followed by an unproblematic usage of the word leitmotif. I'm actually interested in more carefully circumscribing the word leitmotif as one of many possible types of associative themes, um, others being things like idée fixe, reminiscence motives, motto themes, and so on. And then investing some analytic scrutiny in how the leitmotif actually works in Wagner, particularly in the ring, and how faithful later uses of that technique have been in other musical genres, and today I'll be focusing on film. Uh, there's been an unfortunate tendency to lump the leitmotif in with all associative themes and characterize it as its most banal, least common denominator, and I'll give you a couple examples here. I'm not sure why we have that white bar on the screen. It um, is not supposed to be there. In fact, uh, I believe the leitmotif to be a special kind of associative theme for three reasons. Um, first of all, it's uh, multifaceted. Second of all, it's developmental. And third of all, it is uh, an intrinsic part of the musical form in which it occurs. So I'm going to go over a brief definition of what I consider to be a leitmotif. It's a two-part entity. It has a musical physi physiognomy and an emotional association. So two halves to this thing. Um, it's a musical statement that contributes to and functions within a larger musical structure, and it develops over time to reflect changing dramatic context. And I, I uh, show this in a conceptual integration network, which is meant to map the emotional space and the musical space coming together in leitmotif space. Okay, so the musical side of the formula. Um, the theme is really the prototype for what I take to be a leitmotif. It brings up all kinds of music analytic questions that we're not going to have time to get into today, like what is a theme. Uh, one, of the primary or one of the primary elements of thematic identity, for me anyway, is repetition. You can't have a theme unless you hear something more than once. Maybe it's in a varied form, but it comes back. And then there's a, um, an issue of distinguishing this idea of theme from motive, melody, and phrase, which are related terms that are often used in describing these sorts of entities. So the developmental nature changes over time given different contexts. And according to Beethoven, or excuse me, according to Wagner's theorizing, and, and I think we can actually trust him on this account, um, the developments that he uses in his dramas are actually inspired by the types of thematic developments Beethoven shows us in his symphonic music. And then, as I've mentioned, these themes occur in larger musical contexts with often an implied tonal center, some kind of musical texture, and often uh, help shape some kind of musical form. Okay, the dramatic side of the equation. How do we establish extra musical meaning? There are a number of ways. One is representation, so uh, things like onomatopoeia, uh, Mickey Mousing, miming what's going on stage, um, culturally accepted tropes. Uh, sometimes the themes give us a sense of meaning through narrative. Siegfried's Funeral March is a good example from the end of Gotterdammerung, where you seem to have the themes narrating a series of actions. And then, of course, semiotics gives us the ability to define expressive genres and musical topics that uh, help to give themes their sense of meaning. And this sense of meaning comes from two places when we experience these, either in Wagner or in another uh, type of musical genre. 
First of all, there's usually a generic cultural sense of meaning. So accepted tropes that have been passed down through time that audiences are familiar with. But there's also a piece specific meaning that gets welded to this theme when we actually experience the drama and hear the music coincidentally. And those two things combine to give us an emotional association. And I uh, will just play as an example the Giants theme from scene two of Das Rheingold. So here, the cultural generic portion of the theme uh, it invokes a, a well-known trope at this point, that of the funeral march. We have a slow tempo, it's in the minor mode, it's a low register, there are dotted rhythms, we hear brass and timpani. Uh, but there are also some piece-specific items that, that come into this theme's identity, notably this anacrusis smear, I've got smirkel, circled on the uh, score there, leading up to the downbeat, and then the uh, exact melody itself, which is rather circumscribed in range. So let's listen to the opening of that. <laughs> Okay, and then obviously when you experience this with the stage drama, this gets welded also to the emotions surrounding the first lumbering entrance of Fossold and Fafner as they walk on stage and becomes part of this sort of emotional conglomeration of residue that clings to this music when it recurs later. Uh, I mentioned development. So in Wagner's Ring Cycle, I find four different types of development he uses. Thematic mutation, Oops. which is uh, one theme retaining its identity but having its musical structure somehow altered to reflect a new context. And in fact, the types of developments Wagner uses are themselves associative. I'm going to come back to that point in a moment. Thematic evolution, where we have two musically and dramatically related themes that are different enough, we might choose to give them different names. But uh, in Wagner, oftentimes, we can hear one theme literally evolving out of another. <laughs> Contextual reinterpretation in which a theme isn't really musically modified, but it's put in a new context and achieves a new sense of meaning. And so here I, I lump in um, phenomena like thematic irony, uh, layering of themes together to create a new conglomerate theme, transposing a theme to a key that might have some associative significance, and so forth. And then finally, large-scale connections that span the work, um, probably the most through going is the uh, falling step motif that we hear in the first vocal utterance in Das Rheingold, Voglinda's Bayavala Voga Duvela, da da, that sound, which Wagner tells us in his 1879 essay on the application of music to drama, uh, would be an excellent thing for analysts to study throughout the entirety of all four operas as an example of just how he takes what he calls a Hauptmotif and uh, elaborates it throughout 15 plus hours of music. Okay, so uh, quick examples, thematic mutation. This is the spear theme, descending scale. This is from Act Three of Siegfried when the spear breaks on Siegfried's sword and the theme literally falls apart. Uh, the rests interjecting in between the scale and then uh, eventually causing the, the theme to cease. This is a type of development Wagner's fond of for the passing away of influences of, of certain items in the drama. So we hear the same sort of thing happen when Alberich loses the ring to Wotan, when he loses the Tarnhelm, those themes fall apart. When the curse breaks at the end of Gutter Damerung, same sort of thing. Uh, an example of thematic evolution. So the Giants theme we just listened to. When we get to Siegfried, Act One becomes Fafner as Dragon. This character has been corrupted by the ring, and his physical and moral corruption is reflected by his new theme to accompany his new form. So we still have a slow tempo, minor mode, low register, circumscribed uh, melodic range, and so forth, dotted sounding rhythms. But that uh, perfect fourth, dum, ba, bum, 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 gets corrupted here to a considerably more dissonant interval, bum, bum. Bum, the tritone or augmented fourth. Uh, nevertheless, the theme's still recognizable. We, we realize that some sort of shift has occurred because uh, of the musical developments. Okay, contextual reinterpretation very quickly. 
the music that accompanies Wotan's final kiss to Brunhilde on the rock at the end of Die Valkyra comes back when uh, Wotan kisses off Alberich in act two of Siegfried outside of Fafner's cave and says farewell to him. So uh, not so much the music being changed, but the context here reshaping the meaning. So. After Wagner, this idea of the leitmotif really takes off, not only in texted and staged works like opera, but those that have just a text, uh, song cycle for instance, just a stage drama like ballet, or neither, like program symphony. And a short work, a short list of some composers who adopted this style of associative theme is there on the right. So that brings me to film music, which is of course another later genre that adopts the Wagnerian leitmotif, at least in some cases. Um, quick background on film music. Uh, incidental music was present almost from the beginning for a number of reasons. Some of those are to mask the noise of the projector, to provide continuity in this newly discontinuous uh, artwork or art form that audiences were largely unfamiliar with, and to help set the mood often with examples of Western art music that audiences were already familiar with. So you may have heard of the anthologies that organists and orchestra conductors had at their disposal of uh, pieces like The Ride of the Valkyries or Lohengrin's Wedding March that they would insert into dramatically appropriate points in the film. So when we move from movies to talkies in the 1920s, uh, originally people thought the incidental music would vanish, there was no need for it, and it would compete with the spoken dialogue. Actually, what happened is that uh, movie makers and audiences felt something was missing. And many of these functions of music were necessary for the success of the art film. So uh, what happens then is we begin to get music as part of the soundtrack. And in the 30s and 40s, then we enter this golden age of film music, uh, mainly composed by composers who are the cultural descendants of Wagner and studied with um, musicians who had been heavily influenced by Wagner. Film music, of course, is an explicitly dramatic genre. Um, it inherits a lot of the associative topics from 19th century music, specifically dramatic music, that uh, Wagnerian opera also inherited and in part helped create. Music, however, ends up being just one part of the soundtrack and has to coexist with the dialogue and with sound effects. So that's different from uh, what we've seen with earlier dramatic musics. Also, film uh, plays with something that 19th century opera did as well. The distinction between diegetic music, that is music that occurs as part of the story that the characters on stage are making or experiencing, and non-diegetic music that's there primarily for the audience. Um, because of the typically short cuts in, in film music, there's a need for concise, pithy gestures of, uh, uh, about you know, thematic plus some development length. And then we find that uh, much of the time, the associative theme becomes what uh, Michael Mattesino calls secularized. So that is, it's taken out of this holy temple of the Wagnerian Gesamtkunstwerk and instead uh, used as a sort of stage prop. It's not really intrinsic to the musical form, uh, nor is it to the drama. It's just there as a calling card. This stands in contradistinction to a true Wagnerian sense of leitmotif. Uh, an ur motif that might weave throughout the entirety of a film score and engage a number of different themes. Uh, the them thematic identity that participates in musical form and texture. Um, and even the idea of leitmotif song, which is something else we get from Wagner, where a diegetic work that's performed in the narrative becomes part of the non-diegetic soundtrack, if you will. Uh, probably the best example in Wagner is Senta's Ballad from Dutchman, although there are lots of other examples. Um, Tannhäuser's Hymn to Venus, Sigmund's Spring Song, Mima's Starling Song. In film, we have examples like Here's to You, Mrs. Robinson from The Graduate, um, Underneath the Mango Tree from Dr. No, and uh, there's one more I was going to mention. Oh, As Time Goes By, Casablanca. Okay. Uh, oftentimes, film mu music is likened unto Wagnerian music as if the two genres were isomorphic. They do share much in common, including a liberated chromaticism, a sense of oftentimes suspended or ambiguous tonality, or motion between keys that are not closely related. They share a uh, semantic code from 19th century dramatic music. 
And the films that really engage with Wagnerian leitmotif also tend to engage with myth. So I've found these most often in fantasy, science fiction, and horror films. Uh, both have the possibility for intertextuality. Um, John Williams and Wagner, for instance, both quote themselves in their, their works. And then they both use associative themes, though the Wagnerian leitmotif is relatively rare, and when it does occur, film composers use certain types of developments more or less often than Wagner did. Film, of course, has a formal disjunction. Um, Wagnerian musical textures are through-going. There are not periods of uh, no music with spoken dialogue or pantomime on stage. Uh, in film, of course, it's a rare occurrence to have a through-composed film. Usually, the cues are interspersed with spoken dialogue or stage action, sound effects, and so on and so forth. So the musical spans are typically shorter. Film, of course, is a director's medium. The director is often not a musician, so unlike the Wagnerian Gesamtkunstwerk, which stemmed from one creative mind, here the composer uh, needs to fit into the director's vision. And of course, composition itself is often a team affair, often at the stage of orchestrating um, what the lead composer will have written on a piano score or short score. Okay, so all this brings me to an example of a Wagnerian-style leitmotif in film. And I've chosen one from John Williams' score to The Raiders of the Lost Ark. I've given it this title, Indy's Feelings for Marion. Um, the theme itself occurs during a scene where Indy is communicating with his boss, Marcus Brody, about going to search for the Lost Ark of the Covenant. And in so doing, uh, the name of Marion comes up and it becomes clear that Indy's going to need to visit her because she has some key information. When this topic arises, we hear underneath the dialogue underscored a solo flute, uh, which had, since the time of Wagner, had associations with femininity. It's presented in a singing register with a rising sixth and legato articulation, all of which are culturally accepted code for feelings of love or tenderness. And the implied half-diminished seventh harmonization, which we get later, adds a sort of ambiguous patina to this emotion. It's, it's complicated. There's something else going on there. This is actually uh, an incredibly Wagnerian presentation of a theme and rare for film music. Wagner did not stick to this so much, especially in his later ring dramas, but in opera and drama when he was writing about so-called melodic moments of feeling and how these would work he says that they need to be associated with a definite object. And he doesn't mean a thing on stage, he means a word or uh, some dramatic effect. And so that they should happen primarily with the actors on stage singing a text, later to be recalled in purely instrumental format. So here we have this. Uh, Indiana Jones is obviously not an opera, so we don't have singing, but the characters are speaking, and at this moment of feeling, we get pure melody. You'll need to listen carefully, because this is underscored, but here is the scene. First presentation, Indy's feelings for Marion. So she'll still be with him? Possibly. Marion's the least of your worries right now, believe me, Indy. What do you mean? Well, I mean that for nearly 3,000 years, man has been searching for the last ark. And it's also a great example, I mean, Wagnerian in the sense of uh, how Wagner described what he called a poetic musical period, that there'd be some element of the text that shared uh, a common theme and would have along with it a musical theme, and when the text veered away, the music would veer away too, perhaps tonally, perhaps in terms of its thematic contact. When Marcus mentions the ark, the Marian theme dies out because that moment is over and the association's been made. Okay, the theme recurs a number of times in the film. I'm gonna play two clips. The first is during incidental music when Indy and Marian are traveling by plane to Egypt and we hear now a harmonized version of the theme in the orchestra. It's got a much more um, heroic texture to it and you'll hear the sense of dramatic coloring and excitement that now Marion is Indy's partner on this adventure and his feelings toward her are reflected, his changing feelings are reflected in this new thematic presentation. You also hear the prop plane sound effect along with the music. Okay, so all of this results in, again, this glomming together of uh, musical stuff and emotional dramatic stuff to create what I'm calling the leitmotif space. 
when later in the film, Indy sees a basket on a truck that explodes and he thinks Marion is in it, we hear the theme again, subjected to a Wagner style mutation that I call change of mode. The theme moves from major to minor. It's very, very common in the ring when Wagner wants to darken over the dramatic association with something that has happened earlier. Uh, Marion, in fact, was not in the basket. This is not narrative. We're not being told what's happening. Rather, we're getting a sense of uh, drama from the music and uh, how Indy's feelings about Marion at this moment are, are being reflected. Okay, so there are a number of other types of Wagner, uh, Wagnerian uses of theme in, in film. I'm only gonna talk about one of them. Um, so here I have an example from Danny Elfman's Batman score of a recurring harmonic progression that undergirds a number of different scenes. We don't have time to go through those today. Uh, leitmotif song from uh, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. The students sing uh, Boil and Bubble, Toil and Trouble, Something Wicked This Way Comes at the beginning of the film, and then that becomes non-diegetic music in the orchestral film score later on, carrying with it the sense of foreboding that we had when the students sang it the first time. What I'm going to close with is a sense of this uh, Urmotif transformation across a large number of themes and a long filmic narrative in Howard Shore's score of The Lord of the Rings. And I've got a quote from Shore up there about his operatic conception for this film score. We're going to start with two presentations of the ring theme. Uh, the first is its original presentation when it's uh, described as this evil force that's sort of motivating the drama. And the second is when the ring is about to reach its point of achieving its destiny when Frodo enters the cracks of doom to destroy it, or so we think. Um, in both cases, the themes are associated with the, our dramatic feelings about the ring, but the first one is, is negative and the second one uh, heavily expectant. In both cases, there's a key motive, and it's a rising half-step, scale degree sharp four to five, uh, but the setting is quite different. And I'm gonna contrast that with uh, another motive that comes to the fore near the end of the, the three films. So let's start with the two ring clips. Um, so first of all, the first time we hear the ring theme, in the melody is this rising half-step over an F minor harmony. We have B natural to C, sharp four to five. So listen to that first. Here it is again. It began with the forging of the great rings. Three were given to the elves, immortal, wisest, and fairest of all beings. Okay, and then near the end, Again, we get this now in D major, the closing key of the uh, entire trilogy. G sharp to A, the same motive is present, but the setting obviously major mode, expectant, different texture, foreshortened. Okay, and the reason I bring up this sharp four to five detail in D major is that that same motive, that rising half step, often as sharp four, occurs with many other supernatural themes in the ring. Uh, the ants, some of the Lothlorien music with the elves, the passing away of the elves, some of the dwarf music. Here with Anduril, the magic sword that's been reforged. And it stands in contradistinction to the very diatonic music that we experience in D major for the Shire, which is this halcyon, uh, very human, very natural world that the uh, film starts out with when it gets to the present day and eventually ends in. And so Shore structures this narrative of slowly clearing out the sharp four to five rising chromaticism into this diatonic falling four to three with the final theme of the, uh, of the cycle. Let me play one example of another theme with the sharp four in it. This is Anduril, Flame of the West. <laughs> Flame of the West, forged from the shards of Narsil. 
So, ta 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 ba ba. That's that sharp four. Here it actually falls. Bum bum. This is、uh, near the middle to end of Return of the King, the last film, and we're starting to get now、uh, a movement away from this rising supernatural sharp four to five toward the falling natural four to three. I'm not going to have time to play these.、Um, I will say that the Shire music in D major. Diatonic. It just uses notes of the major scale.、Uh, curiously, leaves out scalary four. So typically, you hear、um, one, two, three, five, three, two, three, two, one, three, five, six, one, seven, five, three, two. There sometimes there's a little four decoration in there, but that scale degree is missing. And so when we reach the moment of conclusion, and the characters sail off into the west into Tolkien's version of heaven. There's this extended musical peroration that features this falling scale degree four to three. So it erases the earlier chromaticism. It fills in the missing tone from the Shire theme, and it closes in the key that we heard the Shire music in for most of the the、uh, the cycle. And for me, it's just an incredible one of the reasons why this music is so powerful and so fitting, and makes such an impression when you see it in the theater. So listen for that sense of completion here as I play.、Uh, what we learn over the ending credits is the, the sort of reverse light motif song into the West. It's got not only this four-three right here in the strings, but also four-three suspensions on other scale degrees, like right here. So the point being here that the themes are not mere stage props, but rather part of a, a very well thought out and detailed musical argument that spans about ten hours of music. And I will close just by saying that I I do believe Wagnerian style light motif is alive and well today. It's perhaps just less common than we may may think it is. Thank you. Couple of quick questions for Matthew, and and we maybe can even kind of start our coffee break as we do that. We are behind, and so maybe I'll just tell our next panel. We'll probably start at 11. But if we could give Matthew a few questions before we go get our coffee break,、uh, Anna, you want to start? Thank you very much. I was just wondering if there is in、um, English music theory terminology a distinction between. Light motif and erinnerungsmotif,、um, and because I think this would be so important to have this, because I think that's one of the reasons why you just use that one term、mm -hmm. for many different things, and of course we always try to teach our students that there is a big、mm -hmm. difference between the two. I will say in general, no. That that term light motif sort of means whatever the person using it wants it to mean in the context. There are notable exceptions, but by and large, it's not defined very well in English. Tom.、Yeah. Yeah. Thanks.、Um, I was just wondering, hearing your paper after、uh, Walter Metz's, if you think there's anything、uh, about the, the Wagnerian light motif to begin with that、um, that fundamentally predisposes it towards circulation in these iconic fragments that he, he was talking about.、Um, and also, I was just thinking, both in his paper and in yours, moving from Wagner to Popular culture, contemporary culture, about the the production of iconicity. You talk about the production of iconicity or meaning, in, specifically within the work, at these two levels.、Um, and then I was thinking again, wondering about、um, in Walter's paper. Well, how does that production continue、uh, outside of、um, outside of the work?、Mm -hmm. um, so that was one sort of general question. And、um, also lurking behind here,、uh, also, again connecting the two papers, is this sort of tension between、uh, you know large gesamtkunst. Kunstwerk continuity and and shards and fragments, which seems essential to the issue of light motif, and I don't know that's more just a sort of theme for speculation,、right. but 
Do you have any thoughts about? Sure. Um, I, I'm just going to speak from personal experience on this and from conversations I've had with others. I think one of the reasons why Wagner's leitmotifs end up being such an important um, component of, of cultural currency, if you will, and the same thing happens with certain film themes, is that he, Wagner did a very good job, and film composers have done a very good job of imitating him, of highlighting what he wanted to have as these moments of melodic feeling. It was, it was very clear from his writings that there was there were special moments that drama and music needed to come together in the mind of the listener and stay there because so much of what's written later is predicated on the audience remembering that moment. And so I think for at least some of us experiencing Wagnerian opera, especially the first couple of times you watch it, uh, it feels like a series of moments. So. Um, you get something like uh, Brunhild's aria at the beginning of Act Two of Die Valkyra, and you remember that, and then there's this long monologue, and you don't know what to do with it. it m the music may not stick in your mind the same way the dramatic import might not quite be there the same way it is with Brunhild shrieking up to high Bs and Cs with the spear and the helmet and all that. Um, and so you get this sense of a, almost a patchwork memory of what's happening because those moments that Wagner highlights are so brought to the fore in contrast to other moments of, of narrative. And film, I think, imitates that. And so what we carry away from the experience tends to be uh, these little bits of, of residue that become cultural currency. Maybe one more Christian? My question is concerning the, the uh, your theory behind uh, explaining the the effects of light motifs. Uh, I wonder whether the the sharp or the the easy distinction between musical aspects and emotional is in a way uh, much too too easy mm -hmm. to explain the the effects you just showed. And you, you mentioned musical topics also. Mm -hmm. There is This is not only an emotional realm, this is a, mm -hmm. a, a, a cultural semantic mm -hmm. uh, realm, which is, you can't grasp it in a way, but it's not only only emotion. And that's why I would ask uh, whether the CIN model is the right one to to say, that's, that's the reason why it works. Yeah. Yes, I wasn't meaning to imply that the musical elements are devoid of any kind of emotional content without s melding them to a drama, if you will. But I do think that, um, at least for a card-carrying music theorist, there's an element of uh, the materials of music that I want to talk about and how those interact with emotionality. And much of that has to do with the music itself and what sorts of cultural codes it evokes that we get through topics and stuff. So um, I'm not trying to imply that the music is completely separate from the emotion, but rather that there is at least an element of musical materialism that I want to discuss, perhaps aside from emotion, and then explain how, how it links up together. <laughs> 